Well, we've been going through um, the last few weeks I've been preaching is just uh, us as a body just letting go of, the, of our attachment to the world, which is so freeing, right? Some things we don't even realize how attached we are, you know? And I, I don't realize how attached I am to food until I fast, you know? <laughs> I tell people, oh yeah, I can fast. I fast this time, many days, and this many days. And, but when I come up to it, it's always the same thing. No, no, I don't want to give up food. <laughs> but it's so good. So I do it regularly because it's so good to just check your body and your flesh to go, you know what? You're not, you don't get your sustenance from this world, right? And so I want to reread this verse I read last time, which is Matthew 19. 29 and 30, the Passion Translation, Matthew 19, 29, 30. For anyone who has left behind their home and property, leaving family, brothers or sisters, mothers or fathers or children, for my sake, they will be repaid a hundred times over and will inherit eternal life. A hundred times over. If you're looking for a retirement plan, This is a good investment because the return is incredible. Incredible. The many who push themselves to be first will find themselves last. And those who are willing to be last will find themselves to be first. And I always think about this verse whenever I leave my family and go on missions trips. I've gone on many missions trips over the years. It slowed down a little bit after COVID, but every time I leave, it's hard to leave. You know, I, I just, I love being home. I love uh, being with my family, and it's hard to leave without them. When we go to San Felipe and the whole family comes, it's the best, because I just feel like I don't have to ever come home. You know, everyone's there. But um, if you ever do anything for the Lord, or if you say say yes to the Lord for something, and you're giving up something else, don't worry. You're going to get a hundred times back. This is the promise. This is the promise. This is the word of God. This is not Joe speaking. This is Jesus speaking, right? So we want to let go of the world and go after Jesus. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62 in the NASB. <clears throat> it says, they, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And we see early on in the Gospels that Jesus actually had a house and it says he couldn't go back to his house because there were so many people. I believe that Jesus was very wealthy because of the wise men who came and gave gifts. That would have set them up for life for generations to come. Only wealthy had a one-piece linen outfit that he wore when he went to the cross. And so sometimes we think of Jesus as poor and just giving up all that, but I believe he had wealth but he gave it up. He left his home, right? And he's the example for us. He said, I, I have nowhere to lay my head, meaning I, I'm like a vagabond. We walk, we catch fish, we eat it, we sleep on the ground by next to the fire. If you want to follow me, it's not going to be easy. Has anyone ever told you that? It's not going to be easy. The problem is there have been people that have told you, oh, your life with God will be easy and it'll be just, you get everything you want, right? It's not true. You give up. You give up a lot. 59, and he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. They may, they may seem a little harsh, but basically God is saying to us, don't wait until your life settles down. Don't wait until you have less responsibility. Don't wait until your bank account is just right so you can now focus on other things. Don't wait. You follow God today. Follow God today. Don't wait for anything because the, the devil would love to distract us until it's too late. He will distract us our whole lives. You, don't, you think it's easy for me to go away for a week or two weeks to the mission field? It's not. We have so many things going on. We've had so many things these 
last couple of years that we're dealing with. I mean, so many hospital visits and doctors things and all these things that we're dealing with. It's never a good time. But you have to go because that's our assignment. Yeah. Don't forget about your assignment. 61, another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And we think about, uh, I think about Lot's wife that turned into a pillar of salt. Do you know what that means, turned into a pillar of salt? It wasn't some miraculous thing. There was fire and brimstone falling from heaven and everything turned to ash. And that's what happened. She went back. She went back. The, the thing that we're going back for is not worth it. The world that we think we need to, we need to wait for or go back for is not worth it. It's not going to fulfill you no matter what the enemy says. It's not worth going back. It's not worth going back. When they were in the wilderness, they said, oh, we had it better in Egypt. It's not worth it. The bond is, it's, it's bondage. And it's amazing how, you know, we think about Jesus and how he disciples us. And he's so loving and he's so kind that these verses are sometimes a shock to us, right? To our system. This is, these are Jesus's words, right? No one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one after starting to plow, starting to farm the land in the spirit if they look back as fit for the kingdom of God. That's, that's really strong language. But this is our standard. We can't change the standard because we want to feel good, right? So don't wait until your life is just right before you go on the mission field. Don't wait till your, your life is just right before you go witness to people. Don't wait till your life is just right before you commit yourself to pray. Don't wait. It's now. Amen? <clears throat> I want to talk about faith. So that wasn't the sermon. <clears throat> that was the appetizer. <clears throat> you know, faith, uh, the word faith, is, it, it, it's a synonym for expectation, right? <clears throat> faith equals expectation what you expect. And, and your life changes by what you expect. If you expect things to go bad, your, your life will show it. Your decisions will show it, right? You'll be afraid to take risks. You'll play it safe, all those things. It's just what you expect to happen in your future, right? When you open up a soda can, that Coca-Cola, do you know you're, you're drinking by faith every single time? You didn't take that liquid, go to the, to the lab and test it, make sure it's Coke. You just believe it's in there. You haven't seen it. You haven't tasted it. You just chug it, expecting Coca-Cola, right? That's by faith. Why do you have that faith that that's in there? Because you've done it over and over and over, right? When I was 15 years old, I worked at Mrs. Fields Cookies in Delamo Mall. You guys remember Mrs. Fields Cookies? <laughs> And they, uh, you could eat as many cookies as you wanted while you're working. Man, I had so many cookies. <laughs> and then when I would eat cookies, I'd need milk. And we could have all the milk that we wanted. So little cartons of milk. And I would just chug these little things, right? And one time I opened it up and I just started chugging and realized halfway through it was lumps. Like cottage cheese going down my throat. <clears> throat> And no matter how many cookies I ate after that, I couldn't get the taste out of my mouth. It was so gross. And so from that time forward, every time I grabbed the milk, I was like, I didn't have faith that there was good milk in there anymore because of a bad experience. And some of us have disappointment with God so much so that you're not believing for the next miracle. Some of you have been disappointed because of a prayer that was not answered. And we have to process that through with God. Because God knows what we need more than we do. He was doing something there. 
we often think with disappointment, God was absent. But God was managing our lives. I had this girlfriend in high school. And this is before I was a Christian, before I ever prayed. And I I did pray that that one time. I'm like, God, I want to marry her. And I'm so glad he said no to that one. <laughs> oh my gosh. I saw her years later and, and she was a uh, um, nice girl, but she was in the world and she was so beaten up. Her face looked like she was 20 years older and I'm like, wow, you know, the life I would have had if God answered every prayer of mine. <laughs> and if God would have answered that prayer, I wouldn't have had Andrea. Amen. That's right. <laughs> Come on. Thank you, Jesus. And so sometimes there's disappointment that you need to get over and trust God. God was there. He was there for you. He was there when that person passed away and you prayed for. He was there. He didn't forsake you. He was there when that relationship broke up and never got back to normal. He was there. Right? He was there. He's always been there. Faith is expectation. After drinking that sour milk, I never had the same expectation I did before, right? If you get a bad Coca-Cola, some of that, that would probably happen to you too. But you're living by faith with so many things. Just as simple as that soda that you open and drink without any thought. That's what expectation is. And so God wants our faith level to be so high that when we pray for people, It's like drinking that Coca-Cola that we just believe it's going to happen. Because we believe in Him, how good He is. Not because of me, but because of Him, right? Jesus had that perfect faith. It says that all that came to Him were healed. I want to have that record, right? And until I do, I have work to do, right? And oftentimes, you will find what you expect, whether it's good or it's bad, you'll find that. If you, if you have a, a mentality of rejection and you just expect people to reject you, it'll happen. It'll happen. It's, it's funny how those things actually work their way into your lives. It's almost like you prophesy them and they come to pass, right? Sometimes our worst fears come to pass, Right? Oh my gosh, my worst fear. Well, good, now you can get over that fear because you're okay, you know? But, but we'll find what we're looking for, what we're expecting. Our, our lifestyle will actually be tailored around what we expect. And sometimes we're like, well, where is God? Well, where were you? You, you, you turned a corner there because you had a... You had a, a a pathway that God's calling you to that's full of risk. He said, no, I'm going to go this way. And then we say, where were you, God? You know? Oh, I'm around. I was calling you this way, but that was too scary. But I'll be with you. So what do you expect? It's a good, like, exercise to just, in every situation, if you have fear or whatever, what do you ask yourself? What am I expecting here to really happen? You know? What am I expecting? Because that's what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction or evidence of things not seen. Okay? That's our faith. Things not seen. <clears throat> if, if we had everything... If it was a reality, we wouldn't need faith, right? But we have faith, and that's the assurance. Faith, the, the word equals a is guarantee, or it could be translated assurance. And in the Old Testament, the word faith, when, it's, when it talks about Abraham believing, and then righteousness was credited to his account, it's the Hebrew word aman. Aman is a word, a literal word that when they used to drive tent pegs into the ground for their tents, you know, that they lived in, when they drove, 
Aman means when you drive that tent peg so deep into the ground that there's no way of ever getting it out. You'll have to cut the ropes. That's what that word means. That means that Abraham believed in such a way that he did not think about plan B. He knew it and he knew it and he knew it. And that is God's love language because because of faith, he gave Abraham righteousness even before Jesus died on the cross, which is a whole theological crazy thing, right? And it's the same thing with Jesus. We believe by faith Jesus died and rose again, and that's how we have forgiveness, and that's why we're going to heaven, because of that faith in what he's done. So it's nothing about what I've done. It's all about what Jesus has done. But I believe. And that speaks to God so much. Right? Our assurance comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we read, witness, whatever, the resurrection, Him raising from the dead, everything else became possible. Does that make sense? That is the cornerstone of the Christian faith that Jesus rose from the, from the grave. Because of this event, everything is not only possible, but becomes truth. Because of that event. He beat death. Our worst fear, our, our worst outcome, he beat death. And so now it's a deposit in our hearts now we have something to expect. We have faith that we also are going to be with Jesus for all of eternity, right? Because of that event. Does that make sense? Heaven, prayer, all of it becomes a reality because of that. Let me, let me go through some of the truths that we believe. When Jesus died, the veil of the Holy of Holies was torn in two signifying that the barrier to intimacy with God between him and I was removed. Do we believe that? Because if you believe, the, the, to the degree that you believe that is the degree that you will expect to hear from him on a daily basis. When you don't expect to hear from him, you probably won't. Because we enter into this relationship by faith. This relationship between you and God, you enter it in by faith. You believe he's going to speak to you. That's why you pray. Right? And I'm not talking about an intellectual agreement. Yeah, I, I believe he speaks to me. I'm talking about when, when the Bible talks about a knowing, it's an, it's an experiential knowing. It's a, it's a knowing of the heart. Right? How I know that there's Coke in the Coke can is because I've done it a hundred times. And I've seen other people do it. My parents taught me, you don't have to worry. There's Coke in the Coke can. <laughs> and by experience, I know and I expect. And when we've had other experiences with authority figures, earthly parents, that, aren't, that do not line up with who God is, we have to relearn that there's Coke in the Coke can. We have to relearn that. And so every time you go through a trial and you're relearning who God is, you, you come up to this wall of fear and you don't know if God's going to come through and he does, you're learning who he is again and again and again. That's what these trials are designed for. And then pretty soon, it's not an intellectual knowing, it's a heart knowing, I know he's going to come through. I know he's going to come through. He's done it so many times. Look at the history, right? That's how we learn faith. So our faith can grow in measure. We first have to agree and believe and walk, step into it by faith. But as we, as we walk it out, we will learn him and who, his ways more and more and more. Right? So when it comes to hearing God's voice, this is one of the first things we have to know. Okay, the veil was torn in two, and there's no barrier between us and Him. Hallelujah. 
It's amazing. How about this one? Jesus said that he would be with me always and that he would never leave me. Is that true? Then when our heart feels the opposite, we have to correct our hearts. Where is he? Oh, wait a minute. That question's illegal because I know he said he'll never leave me or forsake me. So either my heart, my emotions are leading me astray or he's a liar. You have to choose one or the other. Right? The Holy Spirit who is God has taken up residence inside of me permanently. That'll change your world when you believe that. That'll change your world. All that God is encapsulated and living inside of me? Wow. That, That just is incredible. When you believe that, you'll be like, wait, wait a minute. So when I pray for the sick, it's... It's the power in me, Christ in me, right? There's so much in that, and and that fellowship never leaves, right? He's permanently inside of you. Which makes us a walking temple of God. Which makes us a host of his presence. Do we believe that? So we have to step into this stuff. When you read verses like that, you have to... I believe you have to actually make a decision to step into that truth and say, I'm gonna, it's like, I'm going to wear that. I'm going to wear that like a coat. It's not coming off of me. If there's anything else that comes, whether it be thoughts or feelings my way, that contradict the Word of God, one of those has to go. I've been elevated to a child of God. I am now able to hear my father's voice as Jesus did. Do you believe that? Do you know that Jesus is the firstborn of our race? The Bible says he's the firstborn. You know, Jesus in position is our brother and we have the same father. We, We can look at it a different way. We are his bride, equally yoked, on the same level as. That's not something I did. That's something he did. But it's incredible. To walk anything less than that is not aligning with the word of God. I've been elevated to a child of God now able to hear my father's voice. There's no barriers. He, he, he's not struggling to hear me. Right? So my prayers don't have to be, you know, this trying for God to, you know, I hope he hears this one. Maybe if I fast, and maybe if I love this person, and then go, you know, no. I'm a child of God. He did that, not me. So when I talk to him, it's like, boom, this face-to-face, just incredible relationship. Why did the Israelites not get into the promised land? Why did they not enter the promised land? Unbelief. Unbelief. I wouldn't have thought it was the golden calf. It was unbelief. God knew that they were sinners. God knew that they would mess up. But when you do not believe God, it actually cuts off what He can do. Not because He has a lack of power, but because you don't receive it. When Jesus went to Nazareth, it said He could only do a few miracles. Why is that? Because He tried And they didn't get better? No. They didn't even bother bringing people out. That's why he couldn't do many miracles. They didn't bring him out. They didn't believe he was anything special. So when you don't believe, you limit God. (laughs) 
So Hebrews 3.19 says, we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. It's very interesting how that one thing speaks to God so much. It, there, there's so much exchange with faith. It, it, it is so important. It's like the currency of heaven. You have, you have exchanges with God because of faith. That enables those exchanges of God. Unbelief is a sin that keeps people from entering into the promises of God. Romans 4, 3 says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We enter into this victorious life by faith. Okay, and some people may, like me at times, I can whine to God. Say, but I don't see it. But this hasn't happened. But, you know, that's not going to get you deeper into uh, encounters with God, into this victorious faith. We have to believe it. Because it, it, it really couples with the letting go of the world thing. Because so many times we think, um, God's unsuccessful in our lives because of all the things we think needs to happen before we can say, you did it. You answered prayer. But what, a, what about all those things? Maybe they're not his priority. Maybe they're not the things that will get you to a place where you feel victorious, right? Maybe they're just results of a fallen world. And we aren't supposed to put our stock in those things, right? We choose to believe what God says about us and what was accomplished on the cross. We believe that we have the same spirit that Jesus had when he walked the earth. We believe that we are co-heirs. We have been elevated to the status of Jesus in relation to the Father. These things are true. Some people will experience the benefits of them. Some people will not. And the difference is, do they believe it? Do we believe it? Right? Let me give you a few verses that explain this type of faith. Matthew, 5, Matthew 8, 5 through 13. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. This guy wasn't even a Jew, and yet he believed. He believed so much that he said, you don't even have to come to my house. He knew and believed that Jesus had authority over all these things. He had authority. Do we believe in the authority of Jesus? It says that Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The originator of sin, of death, of sickness is the enemy who had authority but he no longer has authority. Well, then why don't we see everyone's ailments go? Because he, he's on earth. He came to try to destroy us because through us, Jesus is going to win the war. Through us. We are his, his soldiers, his ambassadors, his ministers, right? So if the enemy can slow us down, distract us, get us to forget our assignment, all the above, then guess what? He has more time. And he hates us because we remind him of 
God. It is all about worship. Satan wanted worship for himself. And he's still trying to do that. He did it, tried to do it with Jesus. He's still trying to do that, right? <clears throat> but this guy wasn't even a Jew, and he understood that the Christ had authority. Verse 11, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into, their, into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Ah, I love reading those verses. But he's saying, the children of Israel, a lot of them aren't even going to go to heaven. They don't believe who I am. Matthew 15, 28. This was a woman who wasn't a Jew, begging Jesus to heal her daughter. And Jesus said, I've been called to Israel. He says, and she says, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs off the master's table. That, I just, that is so amazing. That someone could be offended like that. Like Jesus was pretty harsh with her and still say, yeah, but I, I know who you are. And I'll receive anything from you, even the crumbs. In Matthew 15, 28, Jesus said to her, Woman, your faith is great. It paid off. It paid off. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. See, your faith will drive you to do things that your fear will not. Your faith will cause you to go further than your fear will allow you to go. And sometimes that breakthrough is after season of perseverance. And that perseverance doesn't even feel like perseverance because you're just believing that it's going to happen. And that faith is the motivator. It drives you to prayer. It drives you, right? It drives you to fight for your marriage. It drives you to fight for your child. That's a prodigal. That faith drives you. When fear drives you, it cuts that off. It cuts faith off. In many ways, they are so opposite. Matthew 17, 19 through 20. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? Talking about a demon. And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. Because of the littleness of your faith. That was the reason. That was the reason. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. These, these verses challenge me so much, right? Do they challenge you? They just, I just have to have a little faith that this mountain will move from here to there. What? I have been praying for this ingrown toenail for you. I don't have one. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, the littlest things. You're like... It's, it's, it's that journey of like, okay, okay, I'm hearing you again, God. I'm going to remind myself to keep going after this, right? I'm not going to give up because those who, who do not give up win. I said nothing will be impossible for you. I disagree with that. I do nothing all the time. <laughs> Dad joke. <clears throat> Mark 2, 4... And five says, being unable to get to him because of the crowd, get to Jesus, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, 
They let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then he was healed and they got to walk out of there, right? Sometimes your friends will have the faith for you. Yeah. Do not give up. This is a, a, I'm quoting a verse. Do not give up on getting together in fellowship. Right? And pick your friends well. Pick friends that are on fire for Jesus. I'm telling you, it makes all the difference. Hang around people that are believing God for the impossible. It's because of the faith of his friends. I love that. We enter into our promises by faith. We don't enter into our promises with pity parties. Now, faith has to do with the gifts. We've been talking about, you know, hearing God and definitely requires faith. We're stepping into this 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts. And faith has a lot to do with the gifts. Believing who's in you, believing that he wants to do something through you, believing that at any moment, any of the gifts are available because the Holy Spirit is living in you. That faith is going to make a huge difference in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. There are, a vari there are varieties of effects, but the same God. We capture this. Who works all things in all persons. <clears throat> all things in all persons. The Spirit was poured out on all flesh. You guys remember that? Book of Acts? All flesh. Everybody. We all have it. Those of you who've been born again, baptized by the Holy Spirit, you have access to all the gifts. One Spirit, many gifts. It's how, however He wants to do it. However he wants to use you that moment, it's all available. In order to experience that, you have to have faith that it's true. And I want to challenge you there. Do you believe that if you walk into a hospital and you lay hands on someone, do you believe that God can use you to raise that person up? Do you believe that? Do you believe it enough to go do it? That's different. I would suggest you don't really believe it. Because if you know someone in the hospital and you know you have the answer, the power within you, and you don't go, that's not saying you're a bad person. That's just saying you don't truly believe. And what do you do in that moment? God help my unbelief is the first thing. Number two is, I'm going to go do it anyway. I'm going to watch God move despite my unbelief, right? And you pray for people over and over again until you see it happen. John Wimber, who led the, the modern healing movement, he said he prayed for 10 years before anyone got better. Why does God do that? He wants to see if you are capable of carrying that power. Right? <clears throat> that just seemed like it went against everything I just said. But it doesn't. He wants you in fellowship. He wants your character to be strong. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to be grounded in the Word. And he wants to use you mightily. Right? But he loves you so much that he's not going to 
use you in such a way that would eventually destroy you. I remember I, I met with the worship department a couple months back. And I said, this, this isn't a put down, but it could be the worst thing that could happen to you if you get a hit song. Do you understand that? In having a relationship with God and hearing His voice, we enter into this experience through faith. If you believe that you have this amazing connection with God, your expectations will be like a magnet to encounters with God. And this is why all this is possible. <clears throat> Colossians 1, 25 through 28. And I'm going to end with this verse. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, and he's, he's defining what he's preaching. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations. What is this mystery? But has now been manifested to his saints. Are you saints? Yes, yes. yes you are. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, he's like building it up, you know. <laughs> which is Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Complete in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this amazing mystery this amazing privilege to host your very presence. And sometimes we pray, sometimes we sing, your kingdom come, Holy Spirit come, God come, and it's like, God, we're sorry, we, we, we realize scripturally that's not necessarily accurate because you're already here. You live inside of us. There's, you cannot be any closer. But what we are praying, God, is that your manifestations will come. Your salvation will come. Your wisdom, your revelation will come. But we just take a step back and by faith we acknowledge that you live inside of us. Hearing you is easy. Healing the sick is easy with you. Nothing is impossible to someone who has faith, to someone who believes. You said, Jesus, that those who believe would do greater things than even you did. And that's so amazing, and we want to chase after that. I pray that every, you'd help us, God, that every person here would make that decision to step into this life through faith, to believe for you, to believe that you're with us, to believe that you're working in us, to believe your authority on this earth. And we understand, God, as, as we believe you more and more and more, we're going to see you do incredible things because we'll begin to expect it. Just like that centurion that said, I understand your authority. You just say the word and my servant will be healed. And we're going to pray a similar prayer. God, we understand your authority. You just say the word and we'll be healed. You just say the word, our family member will be raised up. You just say the word our marriage will be restored. You just say the word. My child will come back to you. 
you just say the word, God. We have that. No, no, we, we want to have that kind of expectation. So would you grow us in our faith, God? Would you help us in our unbelief? We want to expect great things from you. We want our faith to match what we read in the book of Acts. For this is our inheritance, our legacy. This is what church looks like to those who believe. And we confess that we believe that you rose from the dead, Jesus, and that your resurrection power now lives in us. And everyone said, <laughs>